at our public's vocalizes uh, critical thinking and deals with stereotypes. Um, at the same time, we would like to uh, raise awareness uh, for of um, in all generations, because we as a library, we can uh, access um, the general public, so we can address parents, students, employees, as well as, well as retired people. Um, and we will prepare activities uh, in such a way that one part will be uh, intended for the general public and the other for the small circle of women who will be enabled to acquire certain skills that according to many prejudices uh, are not in the domain of women. Um, based on the findings of our local um, uh, group of representatives, uh, we, uh, plan we are planning different um, uh, activities such as a living library with books uh, who will uh, who will be um, uh, successful women in the in stereotypical uh, male professions uh, then some uh, summer lego robotics for workshops for for girls uh, programming learning for um, um, women and uh, this is uh, i think especially important a uh, literary com competition which to short, sto short stories uh, titled technophobia is not for women so the program will the program will address uh, the widest uh, circle of the uh, of the public and at the same time offer specific knowledge to the narrow groups uh, through a literary competition uh, then we will encourage um, thinking about the technophobia and women in our society so that is how we want to build an open and democratic and diverse European Union, <laughs> European, European place. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to say a few words about the Europe challenge itself and particularly what's going to happen. So you've heard from every corner of, of Europe, you've heard from Denmark, from Slovenia, from Spain uh, and from Latvia about the challenges in their areas and what, uh, what things look like on the ground. And so the first part of the Europe challenge is identifying those local challenges, working with people, working with communities, libraries as a centre of those community conversations supported by some of the specialist facilitation skills from Democratic Society, my own organisation and the other partners. Um, and from those relevant challenges, we'll be experimenting and incubating solutions using some seed funding generously provided by the European Cultural Foundation and the most exciting solutions that are replicable, that are relevant and scalable on the European level will be selected by an independent jury to, to receive money from the Europe Challenge Future Fund Awards. Now, this is a, this is a great way, in my, you know, in my opinion, um, to, to take those local, uh, local initiatives, the things at small scale, the things that are the, the, the local problems, but also identify the shared questions and the shared solutions and scale them up to local level. So people who are working with their libraries, working with a place they, they probably walk past every day and, and which they could direct, direct a tourist to in two minutes, they suddenly see that conversation connected with a whole European challenge, with a whole European question. And I think that is, you know, if that's, uh, that for me is an absolute summary of the, the great, positive uh, benefit of this challenge, but also the possibilities that are emerging to reconnect European conversations at local level and European level through a combination of community activism, new technology and new approaches at the European scale. Um, so I want to pick up a couple of questions. Um, the first is, uh, it's actually for, for Andre. Um, now, yeah, I run a, an NGO, we're part of all sorts of networks, uh, they're great places to come and meet people, they're great places to kind of chat and, and you know, in normal times, you know, go to events and, and catch up with old friends. But these networks aren't always the most uh, action focused things in the world, sometimes they're more uh, just you know, spaces for people to, co to talk and chat. What does, uh, what does the Europe Challenge uh, network uh, do that's different and how is it going to be different from the existing networks for libraries that are out there? Good question. And um, I don't know um, all the answers to it, but for us, this is, um, is an experiment because we, we, we do many of these things you mentioned. We work with NGO networks, um, we work with um, one of those things we're discussing in a minute as part of the um, Europe Day is we work with art institutions on a European pavilion. 
we work through people to people exchange. We're, we're working on all sorts of different level and our approach is how can we create a European sense of belonging, a European sentiment. Um, and it, it's, um, you know, it's, we have worked in the past with universities as part of, um, you know, having co-created the Erasmus program. That was a, was a, was a good thing. And we are now trying um, to see um, whether this connection, everyone um, talked about the connection between the local and European can be established through this um, working together with the libraries and, and, and the European Cultural Foundation and the Democratic Society and other organizations. So we see this as a start, as a test run, and um, we have big expectations. Um, uh, my colleagues, uh, when um, when um, I'm saying let, let's think big, I always say, you know, what's our next Erasmus? Um, so I, I, I see that as uh, the potential next Erasmus in a way that you can really achieve something on a European scale um, by tapping into an existing um, infrastructure. And, and we have this existing infrastructure in Europe, the libraries, um, they have gone through a, a big reform process, I think over the last 15, maybe longer years as part of uh, digitalization. Um, in many ways, I, I, from what I have seen, they have come, um, they are a step ahead than, than others in many ways. I mean, because um, libraries are places where you can get a book, but there are so much more. Um, and, and people don't uh, see that uh, yet, but um, I have seen it. Um, I'm, I'm excited about what, what's, um, what's on offer in working with the libraries. And I, I think um, this can really be a game changer. Um, that's big expectations. Um, now we have to see how that will work out in practice. Um, but um, even um, this discussion today here, and I know all the work which went into it uh, in preparation, um, that makes me very hopeful that it is not just another kind of, of civil society network, which is a good thing, but um, often manages, doesn't manage to, to um, have the scale it could have. So I expect, um, um, a lot of good thinking, a lot of um, very practical doing, and then in, in the end, um, scaling, because the seven libraries and partners are only a beginning. Um, now, how can we do that from, from seven to 65,000? I mean, that is, uh, that is the question I have, and um, I don't have the answer, but maybe someone has. And if someone has an answer, please raise your hand and uh, come in. Uh, thank you, Andre. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to pick up on one of the questions that Abdul Dubey uh, left in the chat. So talking about how uh, alternative resources, alternative libraries, networks, community groups uh, are started by people that don't fit into the citizen category. So I think there's, uh, there's definitely a sense that there's loads of variety in community groups, those that are dedicated to learning, to information and to sharing things. And also there's loads of variety in the concept of citizen. It isn't just about like the passport that you have or the place where you pay your, your local taxes. Um, so I might uh, throw this one to Nicola or Olga. You know, what's the way in which the Europe challenge is going to involve the communities around libraries, those people who have alternative things to offer, alternative visions, and how is it going to reach beyond the people who are just, you know, involved in everything all the time into those groups who, who may or may not be legal citizens, but who definitely feel they have an ownership and a belonging in their place. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you for the question. Um, well, that was, that was actually the starting point for us when we started to think about the Europe challenge before, before we even thought even in a way about libraries. And then we, we kind of came on board with the idea as, as, uh, as we've mentioned before, ECF had been looking at libraries and their function and their key function as a public space, especially in Europe, but also globally. And um, that was a key question. How are we going to make sure that we're not just going to work with communities that are already involved with libraries? So we um, have made efforts and actually some of the examples that have been given, um, such as um, Ardus specifically trying to work with 
homeless communities who, of course, don't even have a documentation to register to belong to be a library um, is an example of them also specifically addressing this community. So I think, in a way, we started with that question. How do we, how do we make sure we're not just talking to the people we're already talking to? Um, and that's also why we're giving ourselves a year of this development process. So we're, today is an introduction to the Europe Challenge. Today is an introduction to, to the libraries who are working with their, their communities, who they've started new communities, they've started to find and started to talk to and find out from those people what they think is their local European challenge and how they can redesign something and make change. Um, and people who would not normally have that opportunity to do so. I don't know, Olga, if you wanted to add anything. No, I think that was exhaustive. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, so, just one last question that's come out of the come out of the chat. Uh, this is from uh, from Gert Levens. Um, is decolonization a current challenge for public libraries in Europe? I think there's something that is obviously very very live in lots of communities. Uh, I don't know whether one of the one of the library uh, library colleagues would perhaps want to pick that up and share their experiences of how they decolonize libraries. We've got about uh, two three minutes left, so. I'll need to ask you to keep it short, but just the start of the conversation. I think we have Ruhl who wants to respond to this question from Oba. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we we started a project two years ago called the House of All Languages, in which we work together with uh, representatives of various cultural diverse communities uh, living in the city of Amsterdam, organized uh, representatives mostly. Um, and we started working together with uh, uh, various organizations, but one in particular that really represents um, the questions that come with de decolonizing uh, the library. And we've had very good experiences so far. So, so the aim is to um, co-create new collections or put our existing collections in a new context or perspective. And we do both. Uh, we add exhibitions to it. We add cultural programs to it. And we find that uh, it's an excellent way to start a dialogue and a narr narrative by really looking at people who know the themes we're talking about here and know the challenges that comes to it and the nuances. So my advice would be to, uh, to, to look at partners, organizations, uh, or individuals that are really familiar with these, these topics and uh, have a dialogue and start working with them because it's, it's an excellent way to, uh, uh, to, to, to get in contact with both um, uh, uh, the, the existing library communities, but also new communities that you try to connect to the library or to, to everything we have to offer. And I think uh, Marta has just shared a link so you can uh, find out a bit more about the project. That's great. Thank you, Rul. Um, so we're at the end of our time today. Uh, thank you to those who ask questions. Uh, please do stay involved and uh, stay connected to the process. If you've been inspired by what you've heard and you want to get involved as the, uh, the programme develops, please drop the Cultural Foundation a line at ask uh, at culturalfoundation.eu. Uh, and also make sure you're taking advantage of the other Europe Day events uh, on the uh, europeday.eu uh, website. There's lots of great stuff going on, including the launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe, another opportunity to get citizen voices and, and different uh, perspectives into the European conversation. Um, Ashley's going to provide a, a link in the chat uh, to the Common Ground online publication, which you might want to have a look at to talk a little bit, to see a little bit more about of some of the background thinking behind this. Uh, but it just remains for me to say to, uh, to thank uh, Jan, to thank the European Cultural Foundation and the other partners uh, to, for their participation today, to thank their colleagues from libraries all around Europe who've shared their different perspectives and to reinforce the point that this is the start of something, not the end. You know, it is definitely a growing conversation and one that we would like people to get involved with. Uh, so please do contact us, uh, as I say, ask at culturefoundation.eu. At EU, if you want to hear about uh, hear more about it, uh, stay in touch with the European Cultural Foundation and the partners to find out more. And we very much look forward to making this a growing and spreading conversation over the next little while. Thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of Europe Day. <laughs>